when there isn't a functioning government, the business class turns back to its Islamic identity, often for purely instrumental reasons, just so that there's a, a common language of trust. I'm Sean Lynn Jones, editor of International Security, a quarterly journal based here at the Belper Center at Harvard's Kennedy School. Today, I'm speaking to Professor Aisha Ahmad of the University of Toronto. Professor Ahmad is the author of an article called The Security Bazaar, Business Interests and Islamist Power in Civil War Somalia, which appeared in the winter 2014-2015 issue of International Security. Very glad you could be with us today. Thanks so much for having me, Sean. So in a nutshell, what's the basic argument of your article? While a lot of people on the outside look at these conflicts, the rise of Islamist power, and think about ideology and identity, behind the scenes, inside the conflict zone, everybody's talking about money. So behind the rise of Islamist power are the interests of a local business class that behind the scenes plays the role of kingmaker. And these elites, these business elites, are really interested in maximizing their profit base. And surprisingly, Islamists do a really good job of courting the support of that business class, which gives them the necessary uh, financial power to rise to power out of these anarchic societies. Uh, could you say a little bit more about who the businessmen or businesswomen are? You know, we really do associate civil wars with incredible destitution and poverty, and that's true. There certainly are a tremendous amount of, there's a tremendous uh, lack and despair in these environments. What fills the public space is the private sector. So there are thriving war economies. And some of the business elites who I've talked to are the head of the Coca-Cola company in Mogadishu, big telecom giants that run cell phone and internet companies nationwide, hawalas, which are essentially private banking like Western Union, that fill the space of what we consider normal banking. And these are people who are not small players. These are multi-million dollar industries that are thriving in the middle of political chaos. So how did these business elites get involved with the Islamists? In the absence of a government, what you lack in a business environment is trust. So how do I know if I'm going to make a deal with you that you're actually going to fulfill your side of the arrangement if there's no police to call, if there's no rule of law? In order to do business in a civil war, you got to buy your security from somewhere. And who are you going to get it from if there's no functioning government? It's the same warlord that's beating you up. So you pay protection money into your different ethnic or tribal warlords just to keep yourself safe. Now, the problem with this is it gets very expensive and you end up paying into multiple protection rackets or you can't pay into that warlord's uh, fiefdom because you're not from the right ethnic group. So these costs get compounded. Here's where Islamists get their advantage. What they're able to do is because they're appealing to a broader identity, an Islamic identity as opposed to an ethnic or tribal identity, what they're able to do is sell security across these divisions. And by doing that, they can offer a lower price across these divisions. One of the heads of the biggest markets, one of the biggest markets in Somalia said to me, Aisha, for every hundred dollars we were paying to the warlords, we could give thirty-five dollars to the Islamic courts to remove them. So they were seeing big discounts there. What lessons can you draw from the Somali case that would be applicable, for example, to ISIS, the Islamic State, which has been in the news so much lately? So what we know, even though there is, uh, it's very difficult to get information from within ISIS-held territory, what we know is that ISIS's rise to power has come predominantly out of its incredible ability to both co-opt and participate in transnational criminal networks that have been developing over the course of many years. So we can see that even in the case of the Islamic State, we can see that this relationship between a business class and the Islamists was, is instrumental in financing their rise to power. I think the big takeaway message from this uh, analysis is that if we want to build effective states that function in the international system, you need local buy-in. That's what the Islamists are getting, is they're getting local buy-in from the business class. And one of the things we do as an international community is we build these really massive bloated bureau bureaucracies out of, you know, in these failed states that are expensive and we fund them from the outside you know, and from the top down. But that doesn't produce the same type of order-making 
that the Islamists get when they build a relationship with the business class. So what we need to do is be mindful of the fact that we need local buy-in from these elites and from society as a whole. I'd like to thank you again for joining us today. I've been speaking to Aisha Ahmad, who's an assistant professor at the University of Toronto. Her article, called The Security Bazaar, Business Interests and Islamist Power in Civil War Somalia, was published in the winter 2014-15 issue of International Security. Thank you again for being with us. Thanks so much, Sean.